you um, the format is about uh, 20 to 30 minutes and we will have some time for discussion later after the after the talk and uh, it's an informal environment so if you need to go please go um, and I hope to see you in the time for catch up later after the, the, the talk itself. So <clears throat> for today's seminar, I'm really excited to have here Jenny Wong from University of Grenoble presenting us Dynamo Simulation with a stably stratified F layer at the base of, a, of Earth's outer core. Thank you, Jenny. Okay. Uh, I will share my screen. Right, so is everything okay? Yes, it is, thank you. Okay, thank you for the nice introduction, Anita. Um, so yeah, um, I'm Jenny, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Easter in Grenoble. And so as Anita said, I'll be talking about dynamo simulations with a stably stratified F layer at the base of Earth's outer core. And this work was mostly done um, at my postdoc uh, at IPG Paris uh, in conjunction with uh, Julien Aubert. So um, this is uh, just a nice picture of our wonderful Earth, our beautiful planet. And if I took a giant sized knife and cut it in half and take you on a journey into the Earth's deep interior, you'll see these distant layers. So at the surface, we have the crust and then beneath that, we have a rocky silicate mantle um, alloyed with uh, light, uh, sorry, uh, a rocky silicate mantle. And then we have the uh, liquid outer core uh, oh no, sorry, my slides just skipped. Sorry. Then we have the liquid outer core, which is um, made of a metallic uh, ion, uh, alloyed with light elements, and it's liquid, it's vigorously convecting, um, and it's uh, enclosing the central uh, solid inner core. Sorry, my keyboard input's not working. Why can't I click? Okay, and then we have the uh, inner core here. Sorry for the technical problems just then. Um, no so, so we have, um, so yeah, we have this um, convecting um, metallic uh, liquid outer core. And this is mostly driven by uh, heat left over from the formation of the planet. So this is known as secular cooling, which is uh, the main, uh, thermal energy source for uh, thermal convection in the liquid bulk. However, because we have a uh, metallic alloy, uh, which is alloyed with um, light elements, uh, we have some uh, solidification of the inner core, which releases some latent heat into, um, into the system to drive convection. And we also know that the light elements preferentially partition into the liquid as well. So this gives us also a chemical source of buoyancy in order to drive convection in this liquid region. So we have all this vigorous um, convection occurring, and this leads to a, a reference state uh, in the liquid alcohol, which is really well mixed and homogeneous, and its uh, temperature profile is close to um, adiabatic. So all of this convection drives a process called uh, the geodynamo, which generates uh, our magnetic field and protects us from solar winds and is responsible for lovely things like the northern lights. And um, in terms of its spatial structure, its field is uh, mainly dipolar, like our magnet. And over time, we know that this field has persisted um, for um, about four billion years uh, through analyzing single zircon crystals. So this time scale is uh, very long and vast, and it's much longer than the time scale that we know for the magnetic field to dissipate away naturally, which is estimated to be on the order of 10,000 years. So this discrepancy in the time scales supports the idea that the field is being continually regenerated and sustained by this process called a geodynamo. So the question I'd like to focus on today inside the core is this region called the so-called uh, F layer at the base of the liquid outer core. So this is a seismically slow region, which is um, first, which was first observed by Surya and Pupigny uh, back in 1991. And this is a puzzling and anomalous uh, uh, layer because uh, compared with uh, what we might would 
we might, we might expect from a model such as PREM, which assumes that we have uh, an adiabatic uh, core throughout. This seismically slow observation in comparison with that infers a stably stratified layer at the bottom of the Earth's outer core that can't be explained by adiabatic compression alone. So um, the goal of my PhD Oh, sorry, the goal of my PhD was actually to explain the dynamics of maintaining such an F layer against convection using a slurry iron snow model. But what I'd like to focus on more today is actually um, looking at how the presence of the F layer can impact core dynamics in general in the bulk of the core. So in order to probe this, um, there is a, sort of a well-established uh, mathematical framework for investigating this. So um, First of all, um, we have the Navier-Stokes equation. So we're assuming we have an incompressible fluid. And um, this is the Navier-Stokes equation with um, inertia on the left-hand side. Here we have the pressure gradient. This is the Coriolis force. Uh, this is the viscous force, the Lorentz force, and finally a thermochemical buoyancy. So it's not like your classic thermal buoyancy that you might find in really banal convection. Uh, this is um, C parameter, or this C um, field is actually a combination of uh, thermal and chemical um, variations. Uh, this prime denotes the uh, fluctuations away from the reference state. Uh, and this field itself is, um, so this co-density field is also governed by its own transport equation. Uh, so this is the equation of state for this codensity field. So this kind of explicitly says that it's composed of thermal and um, chemical uh, fluctuations. And the transport equation is here. So it describes how the code density field can change over time due to advection and um, diffusion as well. We also have a sink source term because we're continually partitioning light elements into the liquid bulk. So in order to conserve this quantity, we introduce a numerical sink in order to, yeah, uh, to uphold this law of conservation. And then uh, finally, we have a magnetic induction equation. So this uh, means that we have no magnetic monopoles. And this is um, basically describing how the magnetic field changes over time due to um, the electromotive force. So there's a feedback between um, the fluid flow and uh, the magnetic field, which is incorporated into this force. And this includes uh, things like advection of the magnetic field and uh, magnetic stretching by the flow. And this is the diffusion term. So this system of equations that I've um, just presented are in a dimensionless form. So you can see uh, these, uh, there's these uh, dimensionless control parameters um, in this presentation, and um, they're defined as follows. So here we have a flux based Rayleigh number. So compared to the classical Rayleigh number, um, this takes into account um, buoyancy driven by thermochemical sources, uh, which is denoted by this um, F value here, which is the co-density flux. And um, this is a ratio between that flux and uh, rotation in the system. Here is the Ekman number, which is the ratio between the viscous forces and the Coriolis force. This is the Prandtl number, which is the viscous over um, the diffusivity of the co-density. And this is the magnetic Prandtl number, uh, which is the ratio between viscous and uh, uh, the magnetic diffusivity. Um, so this is kind of the, the sort of the frame the framework that we use to probe uh, core dynamics that's used very commonly in uh, dynamo calculations. And in order to solve those equations, we need to impose some boundary conditions as well. So the velocity is subject to uh, stress-free uh, conditions at the inner core boundary and at the core mantle boundary. Um, and then also we have a coupled system in which the inner core is free to rotate. Um, so it's electrically conducting and it's a rigid body that can super rotate uh, subject to electromagnetic and gravitational talks with the rest of the system. Um, and we also have, uh, assume uh, electrically insulating mantle because we have a silicate uh, rocky medium there. 
and um, we implement this uh, coupling between uh, the, the core and the mantle because it's able to reproduce well-known um, features of the magnetic field that we can observe um, at the surface of the Earth, uh, known as secular variation. So one such feature is the observed uh, westward drift of the magnetic field uh, seen from uh, uh, you know, ground observatories and, and satellite observations. So on to sort of the more novel bit, this is um, how the um, F layer is invoked through imposing boundary conditions on the co-density. So uh, we have, um, we impose a uh, gradient on, we, we impose a, sorry, uh, a condition on the gradient of the variations in the co-density field at the inner core boundary uh, given by this value here. And this introduces a, a parameter uh, called Fi in this, in this instance, which is the ratio between the total uh, code density flux at the inner core boundary and the total code density flux at the F layer radius. And this essentially control, controls the strength of stratification um, within the F layer. And you can um, sort of relate this to something more well known, such as the buoyancy frequency or the brook Vaisala frequency uh, through this relationship here. And so uh, this is the boundary condition at the F layer radius uh, given by so. And since we are assuming that we have a purely adiabatic heat flux uh, at the CMB, we say that the variations um, in the codensity uh, gradient at this uh, boundary is equal to zero. So uh, in order to solve these equations and perform dynamo simulations, we're using uh, a code called parity, which was originally uh, written by Emmanuel Dormy and further developed by Julien Aubert. And uh, this uses spherical harmonic expansions in the theta and phi directions uh, with a second order finite difference method in the radial direction. And we have an increase, uh, sorry, a decrease in the spacing uh, in between the radial grid points towards the boundaries in order to um, try and capture more small scale effects there. Uh, we time step through the code um, using a crank Nicholson scheme for the diffusion terms and adding smash for the other terms. And uh, we fix the dimensionless parameters as follows. So uh, for the flux based Rayleigh number, we have 2.7 times 10 to the minus five. And on the right hand side of this column is what we uh, would expect um, in the Earth's regime. And for the Ekman number, we choose uh, three times 10 to the minus five. For the Earth, it's 10 to the minus 15. So again, uh, we have this uh, big discrepancy between what we fix in this model and, and what we might expect in the Earth. And this is because we are really limited by the computational power needed um, in order to resolve, um, resolve um, sort of uh, small scale features if we went to the Earth's regime. However, in the Dynamo community, there's been a lot of effort to um, develop robust scaling analyses in order to um, allow extrapolation to the Earth's regime. Um, so even though we choose these conservative values, it um, still is indicative of what we might expect in the real Earth. Um, and also we fix the parental number at one. Uh, for anything much less than that, the magnetic field is not so much dipole dominated anymore, which is um, not representative of what we know about the Earth. And um, this is the magnetic Prentzel number we choose. And um, it should be noted that um, the Ekman number and the Prentzel, magnetic Prentzel number should be uh, decreased together because at some point there's not enough energy to maintain the magnetic field against ohmic dissipation. Um, so that um, they're kind of, you have to decrease them both together. For the F layer radius, um, we choose a dimensionless uh, radius of 0.7, which corresponds to about 350 kilometers in dimensional units. From seismic studies, uh, we actually see in the literature that the F layer um, thickness can be anywhere between 150 and maybe up to 400 kilometers. And then um, finally, we have the uh, buoyancy frequency. Um, to control the strength of stratification within the F layer. So in this model, um, we've implemented uh, 14.7. Um, and then 
there's not really any estimates in the literature uh, for the Earth, but just using a really crude estimate um, from Prem, in the Earth layer, it might be expected to be around 13. So here are some uh, 3D uh, videos of the um, phi velocity on the left-hand side, the radial magnetic field in the middle, and the uh, co-density field on the right-hand side. So from the blue color, you can see immediately that there's very strong retrograde flows everywhere due to this uh, coupled, uh, coupled model uh, between the core and the mantle. And we have this uh, super rotating inner core um, given by the red colors here. And the dynamics of the flow are quite distinctive inside um, the, this region compared to the outside. And this imaginary region is called the tangent cylinder. So this is uh, basically an imaginary volume that is um, just touching the inner core boundary that extends in the Z direction. But you could imagine that with an F layer, the um, effective tangent cylinder region would be increased due to um, a, the presence of a stable region at the bottom of the Earth's outer core. Um, so within the tangent cylinder region, we have more uh, plume-like uh, and large upwellings occurring, whereas outside the tangent cylinder, we have uh, columnar structures due to the influence of rotation. Um, in the magnetic field, there are intense regions um, that break up the columnar structure of the flow and the scale of the magnetic field, um, we have some large scale structures in the bulk and more smaller scale uh, features um, at the F layer radius, which is also reflected in uh, the small scale plumes that you can see in the co-density field. Um, and this is through the buoyancy generated from the latent heat and light element release here, which results in bottom driven convection. You can also see that light elements tend to pile up within the tangent cylinder given by the yellow area here. So I'm um, just looking at some time average fields and uh, spatially average fields. Uh, this is a meridional uh, section uh, through the core with uh, no F layer. So on the left hand side, again, we see the velocity. Uh, in the middle, it's the magnetic field and on the right hand side, it's the density. And the colors denote the phi direction and the line contours are the, are the meridional um, components. So um, from a fluid dynamical perspective, what I've done is um, sort of artificially increase the radius of the inner core to the um, F layer radius that I'm comparing to, because this makes sure that um, I'm comparing the same convective volume between the two, so that there's a similar um, uh, overall buoyancy uh, power in order. Um, yeah, so uh, this reference case again, yeah, has an artificially inflated inner core. Uh, you can see that um, immediately you, a first order observation would be that the amplitude of the uh, zone of velocity is much stronger with an F layer uh, at the equator um, beneath the CMB compared with the reference case. Um, and this is mainly because the convective shear in the system um, that's being partitioned um, between the local shear at the, at the CMB and the shear uh, close to the ICB. So what, what, sorry, what's essentially happening is the F layer is reducing the shear between the liquid and solid um, at the ICB, which therefore contributes to the remote electromagnetic magnetic torques and also um, enhances the westward flow beneath the CMB in order to conserve the total angular momentum of the system. We also can see from the meridional contours that upwellings in the tangent cylinder diverge under the CMB and converge towards the tangent cylinder edge in this uh, twisting polar vortex, which produ produces a local minimum uh, in the magnetic field at the poles, since the field lines are vected away uh, with a diverging flow under the core surface and amplified here at the tangent cylinder edge due to field line stretching. Um, so this uh, describes uh, the dynamics that um, it results in these polar magnetic minima. And actually between the two cases, the magnetic energy content is 1.3 times stronger with an F flare, uh, just from looking at the Alsace number. 
And um, as I said, the light elements pilot within the tangent cylinder. And here we have weaker lateral gradients in the co-density field. And we believe this uh, alters the thermal wind balance, which is the balance between Coriolis, uh, Coriolis forces, uh, buoyancy, and uh, the Lorentz force. So um, this, uh, this results in the rearrangement of the um, phi velocity in which you can see um, so yeah, we have, you can see the relationship between how the changes in the co-density field can influence the um, core flow structures through this thermal wind balance. And then looking at more of an observational perspective rather than a fluid dynamical one, it'd be interesting to see how the magnetic field morphology at the core surface um, can be compared um, to the uh, observations that we might see from satellite data. So in our simulations, um, here for our reference case, we have a regular sized inner core with no F layer. And on the left-hand side, we have the full resolution. And on the right-hand side, we've truncated the uh, radial magnetic field here that we're seeing at the core surface to degree 13, uh, which is um, consistent with what we might see from the observations. Um, and um, with the F layer, uh, we have um, images like so. And you can see that the uh, color barrel range uh, tells us that we have uh, more surface field uh, exiting the shell here in the F layer case than, than without. And um, you can also see, uh, yeah, we have a stronger surface field, but the same LSAS number because of um, more field exiting the shell. And, also in these pictures, you can see these patches uh, of weaker field, uh, which are the polar magnetic minima that I mentioned in the previous slide. And you can see this sharp gradient um, that is coincident with the tangent cylinder radius. And so it would be interesting to know whether this signature could be observed um, from the observations and maybe perhaps like is, it's it's kind of, you could probably hypothesize that the tangent cylinder radius has has an influence on the uh, envelope of the polar magnetic minima. Um, in this case, the latitude is uh, shifted by about ten degrees, uh, with a uh, F layer radius of uh, 0.7. So, in varying the F layer ra radius, um, I've taken a range of uh, radii like so. Uh, and here are the corresponding dimensional values. And what I've looked at is uh, a phi averaged and time averaged um, radial field at the core surface as a function of latitude. So this is the reference case again, which corresponds to what we saw on the previous slide. Um, and here is the, the peak at which you see the envelope of the polar magnetic minima. So there's one here and one here for, for both poles. And uh, the reference case of this peak is coincident uh, with the tangent cylinder radius at 69 uh, degrees. And with the increasing uh, layer thicknesses, you can see how um, this peak shifts uh, as a function of the F layer radius. So this location um, increases by about two degrees uh, for every 100 kilometers in uh, F layer. And um, it would be really interesting to make a comparison to current geomagnetic models, such as GUFM, CHAOS, and COVOPS, in order to uh, see if we can uh, detect such a signature and provide some kind of independent constraint on the F layer radius um, in addition to what we can see in seismology. So uh, in summary, um, we've looked at um, how a stably stratified F layer might affect core dynamics. And what we see is um, strong westward azimuthal flows that are uh, particularly enhanced close to the CMB and equator due to the arrangement of thermal winds. And this is caused by the lack of local shear between the inner core and the F layer. Um, this then through uh, angular momentum conservation uh, changes the local shear at the CMB, um, which means that more field can exit the fluid shell. And uh, would it be possible to see a signature of F 
of the F layer in geomagnetic observations. Well, I've tried to probe this by uh, changing the F layer thickness and uh, see uh, its effect on, um, well, which effectively changes the tangent cylinder radius, and then therefore trying to see if there's a corresponding change in the latitude of the polar magnetic minimum. So um, I think I'd like to uh, wrap up here and uh, thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jenny. Great presentation. Let's all Thank give you. a big round of applause. <laughs> and uh, it is time now for questions. If anybody in the audience has one, uh, you can unmute yourself. Andy, you're ready. Hi. Hi, Andy. Hi, Anita. Hi, Jenny. Um, thanks for a really great talk. Some very, very interesting stuff there. Um, Hi. So a, a question, and um, first of all, then is uh, how long do you run these models for? How many magnetic diffusion times, or what fraction of a magnetic diffusion time? Yeah. Um, so in these models, it's at least two. Um, so I've not had time to run them for much longer because obviously, you know, they take a long time. Uh, but yeah, there's been a lot of checks to see whether. Uh, the, especially with the rotation involved, um, whether things have uh, equilibrated, so making sure that everything's you know statistically steady. Um, so yeah, that was kind of one of the most important checks to make um, due to how sort of the talks the talks in the system establish themselves. Uh, yeah, and checking that's that's all good. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's an impressive amount of time. That must have chewed up some serious <laughs> um, computing uh, time. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> and, and there's no, just to check, there's no hyperdiffusion in these, right? No hyperdiffusion, no, um, which is kind of like one of the motivations for choosing, you know, like stress-free uh, velocity boundary conditions, um, just to, so we don't have any uh, artificial sort of viscous talks entering the system. Sure. Um, okay, so then I guess uh, uh, my other point is, is, is a comment then really, which is, you know, you, you're talking about looking at comparing, you know, the, these fields to um, uh, to satellite observations and so on. Yeah, um, that's the hope, that's, yeah. That, that's of course only, you know, only a, a, a single, you know, time step, right? Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. You know, decades. Um, and even, you know, kind of looking at a, a decent model you know, like GUFM or something, still only looking at, at centuries. Um, so, you, you know, we're not sure quite how representative that is of the, of the you know, the time average fields which you're looking at, which, you know, hundreds of thousands of years potentially, right, that you're averaging over. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd be encouraging you to, to compare it to the, the paleomagnetic um, field as well. And there are these, yeah. you know, these new QPM criteria. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Which which are out there, which which I would I would be very interested to um, okay. yeah, to run past these these models and, and yeah um I would be wondering um I guess you're the person to ask like with these paleomagnetic models um is there enough spatial coverage in order to like sort of say if I wanted to define this to find this peak uh right. do you think that yeah. Would, so yeah. the, the the inner core so that would be yeah a, a, a good investigation let's own to see if we've got that richard bono is probably the best qualified person in the world to answer that question actually um for the last few okay. million, million years um i don't know myself um but uh I, I mean i'm yeah more broadly you know we're kind of you know we don't have um, have full you know spherical harmonic models but we'll be looking at things like secular variation and the, the variance and the in the dipole mm. moment um, and um, the uh, inclination anomaly. Um, so just looking, you know, at those at characteristics, characteristics of the field. So, okay, yeah. yeah. That, and say something on, on whether that peak or the high latitude peak could be, be spotted or not. Yeah, it's nice to have like some indications from the simulations, you know, just, just yeah, it's nice to have them there anyway, in case. <laughs> okay. Nice to see you again, Andy. <laughs> yeah, nice to see you. Thank you for your question and thanks, Je uh, Jenny, for answering them. Does anybody else has a question? Uh, 
Oops. Yes, Richard. Susan, you, well, Susan can go first. Oh, Susan, okay. All right. Hi, Susan. Uh, I was just wondering if anyone's working on defining the F layer from the seismology side. Are you aware of any ongoing work on that? And better defining it. Yeah, yeah, because that's kind of the primary way in which you would uh, go about this. And so, yeah, um, I didn't talk about it much in this presentation because it wasn't um, really the focus, but um, it was more, um, yeah, in seismology, there are, uh, I, I would say, pretty robust observations. So like, I think closer to the beginning of my presentation, I, I uh, talked about this uh, seismically slow uh, P wave uh, that was observed by Surya and Pupigny back in 1991. And following that, there's been several independent seismic studies that also see this slowdown in the P wave velocity compared with PREM. Uh, and PREM is the uh, reference model. Uh, it's like a 1D reference model that um, is, I don't know, uh, it's, it's, used, it's used widely. And uh, I think I said earlier in the presentation that it assumes that you have an adiabatic profile. So this seismic slowdown in comparison to PREM uh, means that you have, this infers that you have this F layer, this stably stratified region. And um, so a lot of the variance that has been seen in the seismic um, observations is uh, the thickness of the F layer, which is hard to uh, really sort of get the resolution uh, to, 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 to get. Um, but this sort of slowdown is, is very robust. So this is definitely, a, uh, yeah, this is a definite feature uh, that we can see at the base of the after core. Okay, I'll take your word for it. It's just 1991 is quite a long. Oh, there, time. yeah, there are other, yeah, there are other studies that um, that are like at Dow et al. in 2008. There's also some studies by uh, uh, Barbara Romanovich as well, who's also seen this slow down. Um, who else? Uh, so yeah, there has been other independent um, observations of this slowdown too. Okay, thank you. Okay, <laughs> you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you again. So any other question? Maybe Richard, you wanted to ask a question? Yeah, oh, this is really interesting, Jenny. Thank you. Um, I was just curious if you had a chance to explore uh, magnetic parental numbers and if there's any sensitivity to the, the uh, kind of dynamo behavior with an increasing uh, magnetic Yeah. Um, no, unfortunately not. I think due to the nature of having quite a short postdoc, it wasn't um, within like the scope of what I could do uh, there and then. Uh, like the basic methodology was to just find a reference, good reference model, and then change, you know, the, the two parameters that I talked about with in regards to the F layer, which is the strength of stratification and the thickness of the F layer. It'd be really interesting to, of course, vary the other parameters, but then it's uh, you know, it's like changing my reference case. And so um, in order to just really focus on the effect of the F layer, um, I've just stuck with this single value. But of, yeah, of course, yeah, it would be interesting to see, yeah. Sure, great, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Anybody else's questions? Okay, hi, Boris. Hello, Hello, Hello. Anita. Hello everyone. Uh, yeah, I have a question. I was wondering, um, do we have any idea about the origin of this uh, F layer? How, how, why, why we have, uh, why from. do we have an F layer? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so that was kind of what I tried to address in my uh, PhD work. Um, I don't think I could go far as far back as to sort of tell you about the time evolution of the layer, but. Um, to actually have an F layer is, um, is quite complicated to explain, um, mainly because um, it's very difficult to have a stably stratified region and also have light elements pass through this stably stratified layer, because you would think that the, the chemical effects from the light elements would actually stir it up again and you won't have a stable region anymore. So the goal of my PhD was to actually develop um, a model in which to explain this, which is actually invoking a two-phase system. So um, what I developed was a slurry model of the F layer in which you have um, iron crystals um, sort of precipitating out 
uh, which allows the transport of light elements to pass through whilst also preserving the stable stratification. So that is one aspect of the question that I've tried to address, but in terms of where it came from in the whole history of the Earth, that's really an open question. Um, uh, so yeah, how it came to be uh, would require like more, more researchers. Um, I think there has been some sort of suggestion from like impact modeling, like from the formation of the Earth, like there could have been some like thermally stable region in, mm. in the center. Um, but yeah, it's not, uh, that's not, yeah, I'm not so familiar with, with that side of things though. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Boris.